I want to get to some of your other policy proposals because you have really interesting and I think innovative ideas that nobody else is talking about. So you're proposing ranked choice voting, publicly financed elections, a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. One I really love, lowering the voting age to 16. Love it. Um, you want to legalize marijuana. You want net neutrality. So these are all phenomenal proposals. However, there's one thing that makes me a little bit skeptical, and this is your provision to sunset all laws. So if you pass all of those really phenomenal ideas, then they'll automatically be sunsetted. So even if you pass UBI, you also have another proposal that sunsets it. So in 10 years, when the date comes up for it to be renewed, I mean, Republicans, they, they're not going to want to renew that. They didn't renew the Children's Health Insurance Program. So does this mean that you support all laws expiring? I mean, the Civil Rights Act, uh, Social Security Act. Tell me more about that sunset provision, because that's the one thing that gives me pause, because you have great policies and I don't want them undermined by an automatic sunset clause. Oh, yeah. And, and the sunset clause um, is really designed to just force our legislature to actually grapple with the laws that are on the books. Because um, right now, so it's not, like, you know, to your point, it's certainly we can't have a society where like every law then gets called into question. So it's specific um, and laws I know the way. Yes. And I know okay. the, the way that, the, that it reads, it does suggest that we're like constantly um, reexamining. Uh, in a way, it's more of like a, like a trying to take an inventory of what's on the books now because we have, uh, I believe it's tens of thousands of uh, rules and regulations that at this point, if you were to go to anyone on Capitol Hill, like no one knows what's going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that's true. Like at this, because a lot of these things have been, been passed like years ago. And it's like no one's job really. Um, and so, you know, we were trying to come up with an effective way just to get people to reexamine what's on the books and then see like, hey, does this still make sense in 2019 or 2020? Um, it is true that, uh, if you were to apply it to everything, it would become unmanageable. And so the the point was really just to say, look, we need to actually reevaluate um, the laws that have been on the books for a certain period of time. OK, um, do you have like an example of like a specific set of laws that this would be applicable to? Like would it involve um, tax law or city? I mean, you can't really do city codes at the federal level. But can you just give me some examples as to what you're specifically intending to sunset if it's not technically everything? Thank you. And it's a it's a great question. Uh, so when I was with some farmers in Iowa, they were talking about various arcane uh, federal regulations that apply to the the way that their um, uh, crops are set up or that the, the way that there's like, a, uh, you know, when one of them said to me, it's like, look, the fact is, if you came and, and came to my farm, you could find a half dozen violations anytime you want <laughs> because like, because they're like he said that there are so many different rules that even if he were to try his best, uh, that, you know, he'd be found in violation of a half a dozen any moment in time. Um, and some of the ones he cited to me seemed like, uh, you know, like like they were more rules for rules sake than that they were actually going to make his crops um, any safer or healthier. Um, so it, it was like, uh, like that was one example that um, hit my radar when I was in Iowa. Um, there have been other, uh, uh, other um, like small businesses and proprietors who've said it's like look you know uh, the fact is that uh like i'm probably not keeping track of a lot of the rules that that i'm i'm um, accountable to and i think that's really unhealthy for a society when you have try people are trying to be responsible who you know if you give them rules they'll try and follow them but at this point our rules are are so dense um because we pass them and then we never unpass them and then we just make new ones and at some point, actually, that ends up eroding the importance and efficacy uh, of the laws. I, I was influenced by by um, uh, an author, Philip Howard, who is a little bit more on the conservative end of the spectrum. Um, but he calls it like the rule of nobody, <laughs> where at this point, no one knows like what to do or what's in charge. And there's like this rule book, like a you know a phone book thick um, that, 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 right. that, that could be. That it can be brandished on you and like we all live in fear of the phone book rule book <laughs> sure so, no it, so it's yeah well let me let me say this though um in the event you are a farmer and you're saying look president yang i have all of these regulations that i don't want to follow how do you determine what actually is or is not legitimate because for example president trump last year he postponed water testing rules and then we saw 
the direct result of what happened. We had a nationwide E. coli outbreak and it was because of dirty water, because of the loosening of regulation. So how do you determine what concerns are legitimate and which ones are illegitimate? Like, are you going to set a, a type of commission of experts? Like, how do we determine, you know, whose concerns are actually valid and how many people just want to skirt regulations to save a buck or two? Yeah, and, and another excellent question. Uh, you know, one of the things that made me sad is how the uh, Republicans got rid of the Office of Technology Assessment in 1995, um, where they used to have an office to advise Congress on tech regulation, and they said, we're wasting money on this thing, so they got rid of it. Um, and so that's exactly the kind of thing we need more of, not less of, where you actually have uh, uh, experts that are not subject to industry money yeah. or lobbying, yeah. uh, and then just they can say they can come and say, look, you know what would actually make our water safer and cleaner? or our crops um, safer for our people. It's like these things and these things more marginal. Um, and so uh, your bilateral commission is exactly the kind of thing that we would want taking a look at some of the regs. Um, uh, the OTA, which doesn't exist, but hopefully the Democrats are going to succeed in bringing it back, um, is exactly the kind of third party objective advisory body that you would want to try and come in and take a look at uh, what's on the books. Um, and certainly I'd be the opposite of the guy who's like, hey, um, let's like ignore the water regs for a particular period of time. When I was in Ohio, um, someone just said to me offhandedly that their cancer rate is several times the national average because in that particular area, Northeast Ohio, because uh, of the drinking water and that what we think of as the Flint water crisis is actually endemic to dozens of communities around the country. Um, and that, I mean, I don't know if people listening to this or watching this are shocked by that. Um, I think I knew that. Um, but then to actually be with someone who just offhandedly like knew that their cancer risk was going to be like several times the national average, that still struck me as very jarring that they just sort of accept that risk every day. So certainly anything that actually hews to public safety, it's possible that we should be doing more of not less. Um, like my, my, uh, ask of the legislature to evaluate laws is certainly not like an anti-public protection. It's more like an efficiency and uh, legislative accountability measure.